So I first wanted to thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us this Friday afternoon. My name is Lizelle McCochran, and I am the CPD and renewals coordinator with the board of psychology. My goal today is to provide you with a better understanding of the new model you will be using to accrue the 36 hours for renewal. The new model is called continuing professional development or CPD. So here's the format to give you an idea of what to expect today. I will provide a brief history of the development of CPD. I will talk about each CPD activity and after each activity, we will open up the floor for questions regarding that specific activity. And then for the second half of our time today, we'll open up the floor again to give you an opportunity to ask any questions you may have. All right, great. Let's get started with the panel introductions. So I first wanted to introduce Antoinette Sorek. She is the Board of Psychology's Executive Officer. Hi. We have Brittany Ng, the Board's Legal Counsel. We have Heather Hoganson, the Regulatory Counsel for the Board. And we have Dr. Mary Harbsheets. She is a current board member and also chair of the licensing committee or the licensure committee, I'm sorry. So attending the full duration of this training will give you three hours of CPD credit towards the laws and ethics requirement. This training falls under CPD activity self-directed learning. We can talk more about this at the conclusion of the training. So here is some background on why CPD was created. Back in 2012, the Association of State and Provincial Psychology Boards presented a new model of continuing education, the Continuing Professional Development Model. That same year, the legislator wanted to know the board's efforts in continuing competency. The board's response to this was that it was working to replace the single requirement of traditional continuing education courses with a, ro with a more robust continued competency model. Thus, CPD was born. The board first introduced CPD language in 2015, and it was approved in 2017. And also in 2017, the CPD regulatory package was submitted to the Department of Consumer Affairs. Now, let's take a look at the requirements for CPD. Licensees that expire between January 1st, 2023 and December 31st, 2023 can be renewed by completing either traditional continuing education or CPD. And with the exception of 100% ABAP board certification, a licensee shall accrue hours during each renewal period from at least two of the four CPD categories. So CPD has training topics that will be required for each renewal. So it's going to be four hours in the subject of laws and ethics and four hours of training in cultural diversity and or social justice. So cultural diversity pertains to differences in age, race, culture, ethnicity, nationality, immigration status, gender identity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, religion slash, slash spirituality, and physical ability. Social justice pertains to the historical, social, and political inequities in the treatment of people from non-dominant groups while addressing the various injustices and different types of oppression that contribute to in individual, family, and community psychological concerns. These eight hours are considered part of the 36-hour CPD requirement. So CPD consists of 15 activities grouped under four different categories. Those four categories are professional, professional activity, academic, sponsored continuing education, 
and board certification. Activities listed under CPD category number one professional activity are peer consultation, practice outcome monitoring, professional services, conference slash convention attendance, examination functions, expert review slash consultation, attendance at a California Board of Psychology meeting. The first uh, CPD activity under professional activity is peer consultation. Peer consultation includes, but is not limited to, case consultation, reading or research groups. Peer consultations can be completed with other mental health professionals, MFTs, psychiatrists, social workers, just to name a few. Record of this activity should include the date, the type of activity, meaning is it a case consultation, a group, or a reading group, and the total number of hours. If you choose to do peer consultation, nothing less than an hour will be accepted. A maximum of 18 hours can be applied towards this activity and one hour of the activity equals one hour credited. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna open up the floor for questions regarding peer consultation. This is the moderator and we are going to take public comment in the form of raised hands. And keep in mind with WebEx that if you raise your hand once, that's great. And if you click it again, it will lower your hand. So you can see the raise hand icon at the bottom of your WebEx screen or behind the three dot other options if you're on a mobile device. Or if you are a call in user, you may press star three to raise your hand and we will take people in the order that they have risen their raised their hands. Our first uh, comment is from Steve Rosier. Steve, I'm going to send you a request to uh, unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Did you hear me? I think that's a mistake. Let me see. Okay, so you did you want your hand raised or no? Well, I'll ask a question. I'm in another state. Uh, I've been licensed for over 15 years. Um, how do I get involved with peer consultation? Would it be just in California or can I do it in the state of Washington? Yeah, you would be able to do peer consultation with other mental health professionals uh, within your state if you chose to do so. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And our next raised hand is from someone logged into WebEx as Sherry Campbell. I'm going to have sent you a request and you're unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I host a podcast and it's based on um, family systems, toxic family, and I have a huge social media following on the same topic. Is that considered anything under peer consultation? Because I am, I mean, I'm consulting essentially with lots of different therapists and the public. I'm an author. I write lots of books. Just curious where hosting a podcast or having a huge social media following where I'm constantly teaching would fall in. So during that podcast, are you going to be um, speaking with other mental health providers or is it just you presenting? It's me presenting, but I have lots of therapists that follow me, both in my social media and on my podcast. Got it. Um, so, based on the regulation definition on the screen, it doesn't sound like that would uh, count for peer consultation. Peer consultation is more for um, group discussions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, where would those fall? Mm. Hosting a podcast. Ah, just looking at the CPD activities, it doesn't look like hosting a podcast. 
would count, but I want to see if my panelists uh, think otherwise. Okay, um, you know, social media and podcasts are just so huge and they're such a beautiful way to reach, you know, people who maybe can't quite afford therapy and both my social media and my podcasts reaching hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and I'd love to see if, you know, as we're teaching for free and helping other people, if that could count. So um, if you are doing research, et cetera, in preparation, for your podcasts or your posts that could be self directed learning because Excellent. You, you are preparing for that and um, if you had someone that you were like interviewing a mental health professional that you were interviewing on your podcast and you actually were engaging in an interaction with some hypothetical cases it it might that particular time might count as peer consultation okay as you were Wonderful. engaging in a hypothetical discussion on a case um, but otherwise you might also want to look at some of the the publication um, activities that we have listed that will that Lizelle will be discussing later in this activity. In okay, these, so those whatever. publication activities could go beyond my books, possibly. It, it depends on what you're publishing, but but we will okay. get into that on the next in a few slides down. Okay, awesome. Sorry to jump ahead. I appreciate it. Just trying to learn the new format. Okay, and the next person who's requested comment is Daniel Koshansky, and I'm sending you a request to unmute. And you're unmuted. Great. Um, I'm wondering how we notate uh, these activities, um, whether there's an official form or I've read that we know, note the date and time and the hours. But is there a format that you require? How are we going to uh, submit it for potential auditing if necessary? What's the best way to do that? Yeah, the board has a CPD reporting form. Uh, it could be found on our website, uh, and which is psychology.ca.gov. And you can use that to keep track of your activities, or you can create your own following the CPD reporting forms uh, model Got it. Okay, thank you very much. And our next request to comment is from uh, Suzanne. Let me find your last name, Suzanne Adams, if you'd like. I'm going to send your request to unmute. You're unmuted. Just uh, making sure that we're able to consult with other licensed professionals other than those with PhDs and PsyDs. Uh, I, like specifically like MFTs or LCSWs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my other mental health professionals, uh, you can consult with them and it would be considered peer consultation. Great, thank you. And our next question comes from someone signed in as uh, Judith Greco Greg Gregory, and I'm gonna send your request to unmute. You're unmuted. Question. One, um, I was able to download the agenda today, but will there be a copy of the presentation to download? And then the second one is about peer consultation. I work for a California county and we have a group where we call, uh, we kind of decide transition and care and we discuss clients and decide um, lower, higher level of care, et cetera. Would that count for peer consultation? Yes, yeah, so for to answer the first question, uh, a copy or this re this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the board's website um, and I'll send out an email blast uh, regard when it's posted. And then regarding the second part of your question, it, the peer consultation, it, as long as it's with other mental health professionals. Yeah. Um, yeah, it could be, and you're discussing cases. Cases, not necessarily those that, um, well, I don't directly provide services. I'm more in a supervisor or manager function, but we make the decisions about um, transitions in care and levels of care. Yeah, it, it sounds like it would count under peer consultation. Okay, thank you. 
You're welcome. And our next request for comment is from uh, Kirsten Chun. If you'd like, I'm going to send your request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Just to follow up from the other caller regarding the documentation of peer consultation, I work at a university counseling center. We were discussing amongst ourselves how to document this. I did download the CPD form from the BOP website, and it looked like that was all we had to do, but there were some amongst us who were wondering if we should create, say, a weekly sign-in sheet that everyone signed in and out of, similar to CEs, but that seems like if we did that, that would be above and beyond what's technically required. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. You you're can only requiring that. like a self, like a self, it's like a self attest and at your own written log. Is that correct? Right. That's the only thing we're requiring. You can use that for your purposes, but for when, if you were to be selected for an audit, um, you would need your own documentation that includes the dates, the type of activity and the number of hours. Uh, okay. So even if people chose to do extra things on the side, they would still need to maintain either the CPD form from the BOP's website or something similar of our own. Yes, okay, each great. licensee must maintain their own record. Got it. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. You're welcome. And our next commenter is from someone logged into WebEx as Scott Bass. Scott, I sent you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Hi. Great. Uh, yep, I can hear you. Okay. Hey, um, quick question. Most of them have been answered, but the first one is, is there no longer a live requirement for CEs? It looks like there's not. Correct. Under CPD, there is no longer a live requirement. Okay, great. And the second thing, and you pretty much answered it. I just want to clarify. I, while you were talking, I did download the CPD form. And other people have asked this question, but I just want to make sure. Okay, so I'm going to use this form, and so is my colleague. We're going to do peer we do peer supervision weekly, and so she's going to do one, and I'm going to do one. But does she need to put her name or license na number on? She'll fill out her own form, and I'll fill out mine, basically for auditing purposes. Correct. Correct. Yes. So she will have her own record. You'll have your own. Of the CBD, sorry, CBD, that's funny, CPD, right? Yes. Okay, and then lastly, because you said something, I wasn't sure if you misspoke, You, I will not need an additional uh, paper for auditing perspective for peer consultation, just this, right? I could do one or the other, not both. I do not need to do both, correct? S sorry, you mean for peer consultation in general or just the... CPD activities, the peer consultation in general. Right, you, you would just need to. Record the what's on the screen, the dates type of activity. And total number of hours. Okay, thank you so much for helping me. I appreciate it. Thank you. So we're going to. Take 1 more call before our 1 more question before we move forward. And the next person in line is uh, logged in under the name Patricia O'Neill. Patricia, I'm sending your request to unmute. And Patricia, did you see the request on your screen? You're unmuted. We're not hearing your voice yet. Hello? There you are. Oh, hi. Uh, I have a couple of quick questions. Um, can you mix CPD and traditional or miss, must it just be one or the other? So you're not able to mix traditional with CPD, um, but we do have a category, which I'm going to talk about later, that's called sponsored continuing education, which is similar to the traditional CE model. Um, and we could talk about that more once we get to that. Okay, part. second question for auditing purposes. Do we need to disclose the name of so I have a specialty uh, with psychotic disorders and symptoms and I get calls. Uh, from all over the country, really 
uh, to uh, consult with other practitioners and give advice. Uh, so I'm assuming, number one, that I can only count the people in California. If someone calls me from a different state for advice with a case, I cannot count that, right? Um, so looking at the regulations, I don't see anything prohibiting you uh, have doing peer consultations with people from another, with mental health providers from another state. Um, yeah, the, the regulations doesn't seem to be. Okay, good. And the second thing is, do we need to disclose the name of the other? Oh, of the person you're consulting with? No, you just need to have the date type of activity and total number of hours. Okay. And um, I think that was it. Thank you very much. This is so useful. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so before we just move on to the next category, you guys had some great questions. I just wanted to um, ask Dr. Harbsheets if she had anything that she wanted to add. No, I was listening and perhaps on the peer consultation, uh, I apologize, my video wasn't working for some reason, but perhaps on the peer consultation, um, when we talk about one hour minimum, if used, it, and because it has to be an organized and structured activity, if somebody calls to uh, consult with us and it's a 15 minute consultation, uh, it was my understanding we needed to at least have an organized activity for an hour at a time. Um, Ms. McCochran, would you agree with that? Yeah, so for peer consultation, you can have multiple um, shorter sessions that uh, equal to an hour. Okay. So yes. you can have a couple 15 minute calls or um, consultations here and there. And as long as it equals an hour, you'll be able to count that towards peer consultation. Okay. So if it, where it says one hour minimum, if used, we're talking about just all together, the, the total. So I think that was confusing to some people. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on to um, practice outcome monitoring. So practice outcome monitoring is assessing patient and client outcomes via protocol, including the use of repeated standardized outcome assessment protocols to assess patient slash out patient slash client outcomes. Record of this activity should include dates of monitoring, client identifier, and how outcomes were measured. A maximum of nine hours can be credited towards this activity, and one patient slash client of practice outcome monitoring equates to one hour credited. So, again, now we're going to open up the floor for those who have questions regarding practice outcome monitoring. If we could just limit it to one person, one question per person, that way we can try to get through everybody. And then, as I stated earlier, at the end, we'll open up the floor again um, for questions. And this is the moderator. And uh, let's see. So, the next person in line is Steve Rosier. Steve, I'm going to send you your request to unmute your microphone. Um, I did not mean to, I, I'm, I pushed the hand by mistake. I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. Thank you. And Sherry Campbell, I've sent you a request to unmute. And Sherry, did you see the other oh, year? Yeah, I, I, I just. Oh, we may have lost Sherry. My apologies. Um, let me take a quick look here if I can get her back. Sherry, did you. Uh... Can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't even know that I wasn't muted. That's my fault. I'm new to WebEx. <laughs> That's okay. Thanks. And did you have a question? I don't. 
Okay. Okay. All right. Thank Thanks. You. Uh -huh. All right. Moving on to Suzanne. Uh, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. Hi, I must have kept the hand raised. I apologize. I don't have a question. Okay. Thank you. And I think people are not on, you know, lowering their hand afterward and that's what's happening. That may well be exactly. So if you can check your display, if it offers you the option to raise your hand, that means it's not your hand is not yet up. If it offers you the option to lower your hand, that means your hand is currently raised and you are in line. So I will go ahead and keep checking in with people in line. Uh, let's see, Jay Weiss, uh, Weissman, if you'd like, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. I have a question related to this. Um, if I am following um, a, a patient, let's say over the course of six sessions, and during three of those sessions, I do a single measure like a depression inventory, like a PHQ-9, how am I recording that in that sort of case um, in this particular category? Is it three hours? What am I, what am I doing in that case? Yes, yeah, so for recording, so one patient uh, is one hour credited. So, uh, you know, you stated you did multiple um, assessments, but one patient will equal one hour credited. And then to record that, you would say the dates of monitoring the client identifier, which is just could be their name or however you identify the client, and then how the outcomes were measured. So, so just so I'm clear on this, so one one patient, and I do monitoring at various forms at various times within the treatment course. That is one hour. Yes. Gotcha. Thank you. Could I just add something too that um, you would want to identify them as say patient number one, um, so that there is a protection for any kind of confidentiality. So just patient number one or patient number two. And um, I think, too, in the um, guidelines, it talks about our measures needing to be um, culturally sensitive. And so I think that's up to the psychologist to check that out and determine that the board won't be checking that out. All right, thank you. And our next raised hand is from Mark Hain. Mark, I sent you a request to unmute your microphone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, so my question, I think, is a pretty simple one, but uh, going back, you had indicated um, you know, that we have the eight hours um, of, I think, law and ethics and then kind of DE and I type stuff would be applied to the 36 hours of the, the CEUs required. And then you have these hours in each of these categories. So I'm just, I, I think I read this a, a a couple of months ago, but I'm, 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 am I to understand that we still have the requirement of the 36 kind of traditional CEUs per two year cycle, as well as X amount of hours that we can accrue in, in any or in, in several or all of these other categories. Is that right? So, uh, to meet the 36 hour requirement, you just need to do two use two categories out of the four, and then you can use any of the categories to fulfill the cultural diversity, uh, social justice, and the laws and ethics training. Um, okay, so it sounds like what you're saying is the overall requirement is still 36 hours, but it's no longer simply 36 hours of APA or some other you know, accredited body CEUs. It can be a combination of activities in these things like CEUs, conference attendance, peer consultation, outcome monitoring. Is that is that what I'm getting? Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. And our next request for comment is from uh, Bradley Tempe. If you'd like, we I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. Tapaski, my apologies. And Bradley, did you get, there you go, you're unmuted. 
We're not hearing your voice yet. I have clicked on. You okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I was just wondering if participate. I'm in a regional organization and I'm a committee chair of one component of our uh, examination for intakes and progress uh, with uh, candidates. Uh, which involves uh, peer, you know, fully licensed peers on my committee and those in subsequent discussion in a larger group. Is that uh, sufficient? Uh, would that count as far as uh, as peer consultation or uh, within the, the parameter of practice outcome monitoring? Or excuse me, just P, P, or C, C, P, D, pardon me. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear, we can you. hear you. Um, so for practice outcome monitoring. Um, oh, so we have to be strictly on the topic of practice, practical uh, practice outcome monitoring at this point, right? Uh, no, you don't have to be strictly. It was, it is, uh, Preferred. Mine was about peer. Mine, mine was simply about getting CPD, getting CPD credits for what I'm already doing, you know, which right. I described. Uh, it's a large right. organization. Everyone fully licensed from LCSWs to psych uh, psychiatrists. I'm a committee chair. I interview with people on the committee to interview new candidates for our particular kind of training. And uh, con and then con confer with uh, a larger group of peers uh, to uh, make a decision on their progress. Doc Dr. Kaski, this is Dr. Harpsheets. Yeah. I think what you're describing would either be in peer consultation or the next category we're going to talk about, which is professional services. So as we talk about the next one, see if the organization that you're chairing that committee for would fit in professional services um, okay and, and if not it might be the a previous category of peer consultation okay so one professional service or peer consultation yeah and we're going to talk yeah. about professional services next so why don't, when you read that when we go over it see if it fits in there okay thank you uh-huh And our next commenter or request for comment is from Carola Hauer. Carola, I'm sending him a request to unmute your microphone. And Carola, did you get the request? There you go, you're unmuted. I'm not hearing you yet though. Unmuted my microphone. There you. Yes, now we can hear you. Thank you. So I have a, just a quick question, and uh, we have nine feet of snow, so I may have missed the first two minutes. Um, what's the starting date for these activities? My license is going to be renewed in July. Can I go ahead and use some of these practices to get my hours together? Yeah, so the start date for this is January 1st, 2023. That's when the CPD was implemented or effective. Um, so if you renew, once you renew your license in July, you can use either the traditional model or CPD, not a mixture of both. Okay, got it. Keep that Thank in you mind. so much. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take one more question before we move on to the next um, CPD activity. Oh, Lisa, this is Dr. Uh, Sheets. Can I just clarify something that you had just said? So yes. for the, the person who just asked that question, um, it sounds like they're saying for their July renewal, can, can they use some of these, um, the CPD? And, and so it sounds like they need to either make a decision that for this July renewal, they either use the CE model or they use the CPD model. That's isn't that correct? Yes, correct. And then if they do use the CPD model, um, only hours accrued after the effective date of January 1st, 2023 can be used. 
Okay, and our next request for comment comes from Anna Lee. Anna, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. Really quick before we get to the next question, um, I just want to clarify that um, and just to reiterate what Ms. McCochran mentioned earlier, if you do choose the CPD model and want to use, for example, today's um, activity as uh, the uh, self-directed uh, learning, you could use sponsored continuing education, which is essentially the traditional CE model, which was before January 1 for 27 hours, and then you would just need to have CPD um, activities um, or the different activities make up the nine remaining hours. So I just wanted to add that little piece of clarification, if that's helpful. Thank you. And then Anna Lee, I've sent you another request to unmute your microphone. And then Ms. McCochran, would you prefer that I skip ahead and go on to the next commenter? Uh, yeah, we could do that. Okay, thank you. So Jim McCollum, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, my question is about peer consultation and wondering if asynchronous activities such as participating in a Facebook group, listserv, exchanges over email would count as like otherwise meet the requirements. Sorry, can you repeat that piece? Uh, I'm wondering about was... asynchronous activities. So you're not meeting in real time face to face, but you're participating in like a Facebook group, mailing with a colleague. Or something other where you're not in the same space communicating, but the uh, communication takes place over time asynchronously. Oh, it has to be done in real time. So you can meet via like Zoom or you know WebEx, but it can't be done through uh, like Facebook groups or email. Where is that document? Um, let me get that answer for you for the exact place. Just one moment. Sure. You can come back. It's later. on slide number nine. It's, uh, yeah, on slide number nine. Uh, I didn't read anything here that it has to be real time. Oh, or live. A structured, organized interaction. About a Facebook group, could, for example. It sounds like when you're describing a Facebook group that this is something that there there might be a communication and um, you know some interaction, and then nothing happens for a while, and then then there's some other interaction. Is that what you're describing? Yeah, let's say I create a group that's like a journal club on Facebook where people mm -hmm. post their responses to journal articles, share mm -hmm. journal articles, discuss the findings in them, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. example, but they're just not doing it in real time. Yeah, you might find that fits would fit more in self-directed learning. So when we get to that, let's see if it fits in there. Thank you. This was that was the most uh, that was one of the biggest questions when we discussed this, the San Francisco Psychological Association. So I appreciate your answer and I'll take it back and spread that knowledge. Yeah, let's let's look when we get to self directed learning and and see how that because I think that sounds like a better fit there. Okay, appreciate your time. Uh huh. All right, thank you for that. Dr. Harpsheets. These are some really great questions. Um, so, the next 1 that we are going to go to is professional activities. I'm sorry, professional services and so professional services include, but is not limited to serving on psychological association boards or committees, editorial boards or peer reviewed journal. Related to psychology scientific grant review teams or board member of a regulatory body. 
program development and or activities in service of psychology. A key point here is that the services are separate and apart from a fee for service arrangement. So you're not getting paid to do these activities. Um, record of this activity should include the board or the program name, the role of the licensee, and dates of service and term of service. So if you use this activity, we have uh, a four and a half hours minimum if used, and then the maximum is 12 hours. And then one year of serving on the board or um, the professional uh, pr using professional services is equal to nine hours and then six months is equal to four and a half hours. So we can open up the um, question, open up the floor for questions. Thank you. And just as a reminder, if your question has already been answered and you hover over the hand icon, it will give you the option to lower your hand. So our next person in line is, uh, let's see, Miriam uh, Hamide, if you'd like. I'm sending a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I actually, you know, I, I hope I can ask a question referring to the previous slide. And uh, it's... We do like a survey, a weekly survey for all the patients in my IOP program. And I review the surveys and the answers every Monday for all patients. I know you said nine hours maximum. Um, and I, I, I think you mentioned one hour per client. And all these hours you are mentioning is for the two hours period of renewal, correct? Yes, so this is all for the 36 hour renewal requirement. Okay. Um, so if I review many patients, uh, well, the maximum nine hours. So um, I think you responded to that question already. And uh, I know it's one question per person, but you talk about organization uh, being part of the board. So if we have all the board meetings, um, all the minutes and the times we meet, we can just uh, add th that information, right? To count for professional services. Yeah. Yeah, the record for this is just the border program name, your role, and then dates of service and term of service. So six months or one year. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so for the next question, if we could just stick to this topic, professional services, and then we'll have time at the end to um, answer any other questions you guys may have. Thank you. This is the moderator, and our next request for comment is from uh, Brittany uh, Beasley. I'm going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Just, sorry, yes. I know you just asked to stay and I've been holding on on hold from the last for the um, the outcome monitoring. And I had a very quick question um, because I'm not sure if you'll get to my question at the end of the meeting. But the, the very quick question was, if you're supervising trainees who are doing outcome monitoring with their clients, can you count that? Oh, that's a that's a really good question. I'm going to defer to my panelists as that is a very specific question because supervision, of course, is a CPD category um, activity that you can get credit for. But um, I'm going to check in with my panelists to see if they. I, I think what would be happening is if you did that, you would be double counting hours. And so it sounds like that would fit more under the supervision. Um, category. Gotcha. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think there's time spent supervising in the actual supervision meetings, but then you're also like reviewing their outcome monitoring outside of supervision. 
um, to look at how treatment's been progressing for the trainees. So I didn't know if that could count separately. Like maybe you're not spending that time in the meeting. You're not counting that in the meeting time, but the time you spend reviewing the outcome monitoring for their clients. Yeah, I think when we look at um, how the supervision hours, which we'll come to um, in a little bit, uh, you'll see, um, I'm looking at it here, The um, it's 18 hours maximum, and it's one hour of supervision, one hour credited. And so if it's specific structured supervision, there's one hour. So okay. if, you're, if you're looking at them outside of that, um, I, I don't think it, it, it wouldn't be included in the supervision hours, but you might find it in um, some kind of consultation hours too. It, you know, you could look uh, to see if it fits somewhere else, but if they are trainees, um, we're in the other categories, we're looking at licensed professionals and okay. not necessarily trainees. That's something to keep in mind. Okay, thank you. And our next comment is from Emma McCulloch. Emma, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. And while we wait for Dr. McCulloch, let's uh, just confirm as well um, that in each of these categories, we want to make sure that licensees are not using a same activity for two different categories. Um, that is spelled out in the language, but I just wanted to reiterate that for clarity. Great. And uh, Emma McCullough, you're unmuted. Okay, great. Um, I have a question related to this professional services. Um, I am actually on two different um, boards, but the one that I think is probably most applicable w would be for a community health center, which has psychological services. I'm the vice uh, president of the board. Would that count for this? It looks like um, program development boards of program development. Does that sound like what the, the board that you're on? Yeah, I mean, we oversee the whole health center. So it's a federally qualified health center where they have medical services, behavioral health integrated into the whole health center. Yeah. Um, so I do a, a variety of different services for them on the board, but we're yeah. essentially, yeah, running the whole health center. Yeah. Yeah, it, it sounds like that would fit program okay. development and evaluation yeah. activities. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. And the next request from comment is from someone logged in as Tine Oprendek. I'm just sending you a request to unmute your microphone. And Tina, did you see the request come up on your phone? I, I think it worked now. Yes. Um, yeah, my question is really general. Um, is this, does all of this start as of 2023? Um, and so that in 2024, the traditional CE model is no longer to be used? Um, I, I'm just wondering if, this is just for this year that you can do one or the other, and then it goes um, to only CPD in 2024. Yes, that is correct. Um, so the built in the regulations is this straddle year of 2023. So for those licensees whose ex license expire in 2023, you have the option of using either traditional or um, CPD. And then starting January 1st, 2024, those licensees whose license expire January 1st, 2024 and forward will just have to use CPD. But um, okay. as we stated before earlier, there is a, a CPD category called sponsored continuing education, which is very similar to the traditional CE model. and. Uh, we could talk about more about that piece. Okay, great. Through. Thank you. Mary. And our next request for comment is from Anthony Cesare. Anthony, I'm sending a request to unmute. Hello. 
And Anthony, did you get that pop up request? There you go. You're unmuted. Um, so, uh, I know that for a lot of these categories, um, they didn't start until January 1st of 2023. Um, but I'm wondering about the time frame of them. For instance, like uh, for uh, like I was on a, I was on a board for um, my local psychological association in 2022, um, and I've also completed uh, the requirements for categories like the law and ethics and the cultural diversity in 2022. I'm not to renew till 2024. Can I count those activities? So for the laws and ethics and cultural diversity, if you took that as um, sponsored continuing ed education, which is, you know, the traditional CE model where you took a course, um, you could count that. That would be able to count towards the 36 hours to for your renewal. Um, now, the program that you were involved in, um, if you're still, if you were still involved in it after January 1st of this year, um, then you would be able to count it, but prior to January 1st, no, we would not be able to count that time. Okay, thank you. And our next request is from some, uh, let's see, Anne-Marie Mandic martinez I'm going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. And you're unmuted. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, with regard to the professional services, it says, um, I'm looking at a summary page, um, and or activities and service of psychology. I was recently, I my area of specialization is assessment with children and adolescents, and I've been asked to uh, do a presentation for a group of parents um, who have special needs, uh, whose children have special needs. And so I'm scheduled to, to uh, put that presentation together and provide that presentation at no cost, no fee. Does that count under professional services? And may I account for the prep time as well as the direct time that I am offering the presentation to the parents? So is this, I'm sorry, I, th I feel, I think I missed the first part. Is this part of a, um, a committee or, or a board that you're on? Um, it's, it's no, um, it's a school. So okay. a school reached out to me and said that they have this, uh, monthly parenting support group for these parents. And they asked me to put together a presentation on an overview of child assessment so that they can actually, you know, ask questions and have that information. Okay. So it doesn't, it won't, would not fall under professional services. But it sounds like the preparation for that presentation can count under self-directed learning, which is another CPD activity that we'll talk about um, in just a couple minutes. Fantastic. And just a super, super quick question in terms of the time that we're spending today, I'm looking at the CPT form. Does, does the three hours go under attendance at a California Board of Psychology meeting or it goes into a different category? Yeah, so it goes under self-directed learning. Oh, so today's time also goes under self-directed learning? Yes, so it fulfills three hours of laws and ethics under self-directed learning. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right, so thank you. So we'll move on to the next activity, which is the conference slash convention attendance. Um, so attendance at professional gatherings, either in person or via electronic means that consist of multiple concurrent or sequential freestanding presentations related to the practice of psychology. An important fact is that these hours are in addition to the CE provided at the conference or convention. Record of this activity should include the name of the conference slash convention, the proof of registration and dates of the conference or convention attended. So there's a maximum of six hours that can be credited to this activity and one full conference day is one hour credited. 
So to further clarify this, I'm going to provide an example. So let's say you attend a two day conference that gives you 12 hours of credit. So you would receive two more hours in conference slash convention attendance. So a total of 14 hours would be credited. So the two hours would be under conference convention attendance and the 12 could be under sponsored continuing education as long as it's of course approved by APA, CPA or an other board recognized entities. Okay, so we can open up the floor for questions regarding conference slash convention attendance. Thank you. This is the moderator and the 1st person I've got on my list for requesting comment is Minji Yang. Minji, I'm sending a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Questions as well, but. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Let me know. Um, I think for this convention attendance category, as long as. If you, for example, attended six days of the conference, you should be able to count for six hours uh, or six credit hours of the convention. Correct. Okay. Um, the other one was completely not related, but um, I don't think is noted anywhere is the supervision credit. So for those who are licensed psychologists who work as supervisors, um, they have to get six hours, I believe, of supervision CEs per renewal year. Is that still the same in this uh, new CPD uh, approach? Yeah, so yeah. the six hours required for supervision, that part is not changed at all for, uh, that is separate from CPD that's in licensing. So yes, you are still required to get your six hours in supervision coursework. But I, and I imagine that's mostly going to be still through the self-directed learning category. Um, we have a sponsored continuing education coursework. So that traditional, so an actual course, the same way you've been doing it, that you take the course for sup on supervision. Okay. Thank you. And the next request for comment is from Cheryl, I think it's Monahan. I'm sending you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. Yes. Hi. Great. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, my uh, license will be renewed this year. I have all my continuing education plus. So I'm going to use the old model. Now, once I get my license uh, renewed, I'm going to send for my renewal soon as you tell me I can renew. So what's that like three months before or six months before whenever I can renew, can I start the CBD, CPD hours then or do I have to wait until my actual expiration date to count the CPDs for next, for next uh, renewal? Yeah, that's a very good question. I've had a lot of those. Um, uh, so for that, you let's say you expire at the end of this month, right? Uh, March 31st. So if you renewed now today, March 3rd, um, any hours accrued between March 3rd and March 31st is kind of wouldn't really go anywhere. Um, so your hours accrued after the day after your expiration date can count towards your next renewal. Okay, thank you. That's it. And our next request is from uh, Suzanne Hershenhorn. Suzanne, I'm going to send you a request to unmute. Okay, Suzanne, put her hand down. Uh, so next is Emily Young. Emily, I'm sending you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. And Emily Young. Okay, Emily lowered her hand, but I do see Suzanne is back. Suzanne Hershenhorn. <laughs> okay. We can hear you. Oh, or I'm on. All right. Well, yes. first of all, I'm technologically challenged, so forgive me. Um, my question is, um, 
and you may answer this in another section, but uh, if I'm unable to attend any uh, conferences live, um, I have long COVID and I'm really struggling, um, but I, uh, I think I have a lot to offer um, people, uh, especially those who have um, unfortunately been ill with COVID and have the aftermath. So my question is, would I be able to continue to just do telehealth? Are you talking about telehealth for um, continuing education, the, the sponsored CE programs? Uh, no, telehealth uh, for individuals. I'm, I'm not, yeah, I have to tell you, I'm still a little foggy brain, so. So your question is, can I do telehealth in how I provide service? Yes, thank you, that's very clear. Yeah, that um, that is you can provide telehealth as long as you follow the standard rules and regulations, but that's totally separate than what we're talking about here, which um, are the license renewal requirements of continuing professional development. Okay, got it. So, but I, so according to my understanding, I, and I'm not sure how clearly I understand it, I do not have to attend any conferences in person, is that correct? Yes, you could, there is no longer a live uh, attendance requirement, but you will see that some, um, that some conferences that are given in real time are considered live, but they're virtual. Oh, got it, okay, yeah, but, but there's no longer that requirement. Thank you so much and thank you for this uh, session today. It is extremely helpful and bless you for working. <laughs> Stay safe, thank you. And our next request is from Matthew Morgan. Matthew, I'm sending a request for you to unmute. It should come as a pop-up on your phone or your mobile. There you go. You're unmuted. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I just kind of uh, jumped in. I had to download the app on my phone and in between sessions and whatnot. And and I sent my supervisor also uh, some of this information. This my question basically doesn't not necessarily uh, it's not necessarily in line with this this convention attendance, but I'm, I'm in the thirty six hours in general, I'm a psychological associate. Does that require? Uh, me to get 36 hours and where do I get these hours from if, if so? These, um, the CPD only refers to licensed psychologists. Oh my gosh, so I've been here the whole time and like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, are you kidding me? Like more work? Like, okay. Um, there's a little bit of relief, but I, I must say, I'm, I'm really happy that I'm here. Uh, so th thanks for taking my, my, uh, my question. So sorry about hey. that. You're getting a head start for when you uh, become licensed. Uh, just like all the <laughs> adrenaline and stress. Thanks. Thanks so much. And our next commenter is Philip Adler. Philip, I'm sending a request to unmute your mic. You're unmuted. All right. Um, again, I, I, I get the conference stuff. That's pretty straightforward. I actually, my question has been waiting from the the professional service and it actually kind of touches on peer consultation too. I'm a facilitator for a, a special interest group through the LA County Psychological Association. And the way that we're structured, I'm not actually, it's, it's not under a committee or a board, it's a special interest group. And so I don't know whether the, uh, it's pretty clear to me that, that, that our meetings uh, fall under our peer consultation. Um, Cause while we don't, uh, by our rules, we don't actually talk about cases. We talk about hypothetical cases. We talk about, you know, it's a, it's all the things that professional uh, or peer consultation is, except for specifically talking about cases. But in terms of service as a facilitator for it, is there any, uh, can I count any of the additional hours uh, for that, even though it's not specifically a board or a committee of the LA County Psychological Association? I would say it doesn't fit the facilitator part of it. 
I, it sounds like you you can count those hours, like you said, under peer consultation, but then you might be um, double counting hours by adding the facilitator role. And that would be sort of beyond the goals of CPD. Okay, so the time that we spend setting up meetings and, and acquiring presenters for the meetings and things, that just, that's just part of the course and we don't need to worry, you know, we still get the time for the actual meetings, but, and. Yeah, it's sort of like that, or that administrative function that so okay. often we don't get paid for in practice, right? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I just, uh, you know, wanted to yeah. make sure I understood where, where we stand exactly. Yeah. So, all right. I thank you for your time. And our next request for comment is from Andrea Forbes. Andrea, I'm sending you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right. Um, mine doesn't fit into a particular category that I can see, and that might mean that I can't count it, but I thought I would ask. Um, this pertains to um, one of the supervising staff at a counseling center of about 25 um, therapists. Uh, we're a nonprofit. And um, from time to time, I speak during the, our in-service hour. Um, I'll teach on different topics. Um, so I'm wondering if the time that I speak in the in-service hour or the time that I coordinate bringing speakers in, does that count anywhere? It sounds like like what Dr. Harpsheet said and previously that it's more of the administrative when you're trying to get the speakers. Um, but in preparing the trainings that you or presentations that you complete, that could fall under self-directed learning. Okay, but the actual teaching itself time doesn't count in that kind of a setting. Sounds like right. No, yeah, and, and unless it's sponsored, approved. Okay. Yeah. Um, Another quick one, my attendance in the in-service, if we're having a speaker come in from outside that's talking about some cultural diversity or ethics, can I count that? Do you have, um, when, you, when you have those presentations, um, are they sponsored CE type no. programs? No, they are not. They are not like officially sponsored, huh? So they, that your, the, organ, the counseling center brings in um, a speaker who provides this additional information. Yeah, but it's not a sponsored kind of process. It's just, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, sounds like no. It sounds like, well, yeah, I, I'm trying to think if it would fit under self-directed learning. Um, and, um, but I, I'd have to look at self. I'll, I'll look at it while, and then I'll get back to you. Okay, just to okay. see if it could fit. Okay, under. thank you. Okay, so let's move on to the next CPG activity, um, which is examination functions. Uh, so for examination functions is serving in any function related to examination development for the board or for the development of the E triple P. Record of this activity includes the name of the exam dates of service, and number of hours. A maximum of 12 hours can be credited to examination functions. Uh, one hour of service equals one hour of credit. So we're going to open up the floor again for questions pertaining to uh, examination functions. And really quickly, before we um, open to questions, I'm going to take this opportunity and the next categories opportunity to put in a plug for um, subject matter experts in these uh, 2 areas. We're going to be talking about enforcement and examinations. Um, it is an opportunity to expand on your knowledge base. It's your opportunity to. Kind of get back to the profession. So, if that is something you're interested in, uh, you can feel free to reach out to Ms. McCochran and she can direct you to our examinations um, coordinator uh, who's constantly looking for examination experts uh, to help with our law and ethics exam. So, that's my plug for this one and stay tuned for my plug for the next uh, expert area.
All right, this is the moderator. And the next person we have in line for a comment is Heidi Kwan. Heidi, I'm sending you a request to unmute. While we're waiting for Heidi, I just, the, the question that was asked about the presenters that were brought into the counseling center, that does fit under self-directed learning. Great, and Heidi, did you see a pop-up come up on your device to unmute yourself? Okay, Heidi fell out of the list, so I guess we will move on to uh, Bruce Lees. I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Okay. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Well, I've actually had my hand up for almost all the categories, so I, I, I do have about five questions, but I will start with examination functions. Uh, I'm on the, uh, I'm the uh, oral exam examiner, examiner for the American Board of Professional Psychology exam. Uh, you don't include those for ABPP examinations? Well, I think that would count because it's for the development Oh, no, ABPP, because I was saying for the development of the EPPP, which is ASPPB. Um, but I assume, Bruce, that you're doing this for ABPP certification. Is that correct? Yeah, I am an examiner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that would not fit into this. So it's only, okay. Thank you. Uh, my questions are pretty quick. So uh, regarding practice outcomes. Uh, it sounds like it's not that rigorous. It, it, we get to choose whatever measure we want or whatever process we want to uh, to examine people uh, to to measure outcomes. Well, as long as it's valid in in the area of cultural and, uh, sensitivity and diversity. So, and that's up to you to research um, and uh, let and let us know and affirm. Thank. And in the interest of time, we're going to move on to the next commenter. So, Martha Christo, I'm sending you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. Yeah. Okay. I've been, I've been waiting for several slides. So I just have a general question. Um, where does research activities? Uh, what would that go under an we, IRB? Uh, we had research activities. Um, well, research groups under peer consultation, okay. um, which is slide nine, it does talk about uh, uh, obtained through individual or group case consultation, reading groups, or research groups. So okay. if you're in a group reviewing um, petitions for IRB, um, yes, that could fit there. Okay. Yeah. And then you, on the other side, you had research. If, excuse me. I have an echo. You have uh, evaluation activities where I can do uh, community research under professional like, services. Is that what you're yes. looking at? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So that would be on some kind of um, board or committee. Editorial board for peer reviewed journals. Um, okay. Are you in some kind of program development or a program that you're conducting an evaluation of that program? Yes. So that could fit there. So it is under professional services. Mm -hmm. If it, you're okay. on an evaluative board, not a board. I'm an independent program evaluator for several community based organizations yes oh okay so this is professional services says it's separate and apart from a fee for service arrangement so okay. if you're being so it doesn't paid fit for the, that then it doesn't fit. fit yeah that would not fit okay so aside from the other one you mentioned for my irb activities as a chairperson the option implementing research projects does not fall under that. That's that's part it would seem part of your work, right? Your professional work, right? And what about 
doing, I'm going to sneak in another question. What about uh, doing presentations, like clinical presentations or research findings or presentations on cultural diversity? Do they, well, the audience have to be psychologists or could it be a multidisciplinary or only with APA sponsored conferences? Um, what, when we talk about academics, see if what you're talking about or okay. what you're thinking might be well. there. See and that. I'll wait. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. And our next request to ask a question is from Markley Sutton. Markley, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. It's kind of related to that professional services and the uh, conference convention. You say if you're on the board and you're, uh, uh, I'm on a board and it meets, you know, several times during the year. Do I just put the dates in? It doesn't matter how long. Mm -hmm. um, is is it a board that would qualify under professional? Services? Yes, the Napa Solano Psych Association. Oh, yeah. So yeah, so you'll write down the board. You'll let you'll yeah, and the, and the number of times you met, but I wouldn't have to put you know one hour and twenty five minutes, and you know, I wouldn't have the times. Oh yeah, you see where it says one year uh, is nine hours and six months that you're on the board is four and a half hours. But I wouldn't have to record how long those meetings were no okay all right and in that same uh vogue uh on some of these things uh like you know services and and different sort of things you, you can have less than an hour unit uh added or not it depends on what you're which specific one that you're looking at but when we, they were talking earlier about peer consultation if you had four or 15 minute peer consultations, that would be one hour. Okay, so in other words, given the section you can put in, uh, you can earn a crew less than uh, one hour um, per session or whatever it is. I think there are some that do have a one hour minimum, but I can't think of them off the top of my head. Um, but I was thinking of self-directed uh, training and and uh, some of the uh, consultation stuff. You may do an hour and a half. You may mm -hmm. do forty-five minutes. Right. Can you put that down as forty-five minutes? Uh, which one are you talking about? Self-directed. Okay. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? I was talking about pretty much as a rule. Well, well unless others, you know, unless yeah, unless it's specified. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If it's specified, so like peer consultation is one that it's specified. You need to have a minimum of at least one hour. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then, if you if you look at like self directed learning and you're using that, let's say you're watching videos or reading a peer reviewed journal, and you sit and do it first for a half hour, and then tomorrow you do the other half hour, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to add up, right? Yeah. Yeah, but you did it a half hour at a time or something like that's fine. Okay. All right. That's it. Thanks. And as a process note, we are going to be moving on to the next section. I will be lowering all hands in order to keep the comments more closely aligned with the section that they are in. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. So the next one we have here is the expert review um, slash consultation. So expert review slash con consultation is serving in any expert capacity for the board. Uh, record includes the dates of service and number of hours. Um, a maximum of 12 hours can be credited and one hour of service in an expert capacity is one hour credited. And again, I will take this opportunity to encourage any and all of uh, those that are interested in being an expert reviewer for the board. It is something that we are always looking for uh, folks to participate in that program. And again, if you are interested in being an expert reviewer or a consultant with the board for our enforcement program, please reach out to Ms. McCochran and she can forward you to our enforcement program manager who will reach out to you about the application process for that. Thank you so much.
And this is the moderator and we do have a few questions already. So the first is from Karen Nilsson. Karen, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. This question's actually across all the different categories. I missed the first few minutes, so I apologize if you've already covered this. Because this is new, and it sounds like it's pretty complicated. I mean, even questions people are asking, there's a bit of a hmm about. Um, the first time we renew, if we make an error and count something, will there be any grace period to make up those hours or where we need to reapply to be a psychologist? How's it gonna happen if we thought we had 36 hours and you all say we have 33? Yeah, so later in our presentation, I'm going to discuss like the audit process, what happens if you were to be considered um, failing the audit, and we'll discuss that later in my presentation. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. And our next request for a comment is from Patricia Masuda Story. And Patricia, I'm sending a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Reviewed. Do you have to come from an APA school? I'm sorry, could you please repeat the question? Sure, for the expert review consultation, uh, if we wanted to be on that, do we have to come from an APA school? Because this APA requirement didn't happen until 2016 and I graduated in 97. So would I still be able to volunteer for that or no? Uh, Ms. Soar. <laughs> So there is an application process if you are interested in being an expert and um, that application review process would take place. There isn't a requirement um, for APA accreditation for that. It's just someone who has a active uh, license in good standing and meets some additional requirements. Um, so you would just apply if you are interested. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. And our next request for a question comes from someone logged in as Ed. And Ed, I'm sending you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. Hello? Can you hear me? Oh, very quietly, yes. Oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, is that better? Yes. Oh, okay, hi. So uh, I'm I'm more of a practical person, if you will. Um, the the overall theme I'm understanding from this new concept of the CPD is that uh, you know when in doubt ask. But the general uh, idea I'm getting from this is that which I appreciate a lot is that uh, as long as if, if the discussion in whichever form, like in the different forms that can take in different kind of settings, uh, the main thing you want to look for is that it's addressing something clinically relevant of a case, and you can kind of work with that to count for the uh, for the hours. Is that fair? Is that a fair summary, kind of? Could you, Ed, could you please repeat that again, working with some, I didn't quite get it. Sure. Can you hear me though? Yes, I can now. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I live in an area, Southern San Diego, where the signal is very bad. So I apologize if I'm cutting on in and out. Um, so the general ideas that I'm getting here is that um, as long as it's um, as a topic in whichever kind of setting it's being used, whether uh, article reviewing, research reviewing for publications and such, um, treatment settings, treatment meetings or whatnot, um, as long as it's being a clinical nature regarding um, patients, something of the sort, it's likely to apply. I'm a fan of when in doubt, just ask the, uh, the board or your department. Um, are, you, but, are you asking about like peer consultation? Or well, self directed a, learning, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, it just in general, as long as it's something of clinical utility, um, would that be? Is, I'm getting the impression like that seems to be the the common trend, the thread, trend here, if you will, not trend of the. I, I would add that, that yes, that's important. 
Um, but also, I think one of the goals of CPD is to help us expand our um, experience as psychologists beyond certainly. our offices, right? And yeah, so yeah, certainly. Learn sort of more about what is our profession about, um, and um, so it's just taking us out of our offices and helping us to be better clinicians through those experiences too. Certainly, yeah. So I, I consult with um, with colleagues all the time, former mentors, current mentors, etc. So those kind of meetings, um, they could count as long as we meet the criteria. Correct? Yeah, those kinds of consultations, sure. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And our next request is from Dr. Loy Medvin. I'll go ahead and uh, send you a request. Hey. Uh we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so my question, I'm not sure where it goes, um, but I'm receiving a training and supervision to become certified in a specific modality. Where would I put that? So it would depend if you're, are you getting a BAP certification or um, that could count under that if there's academic coursework, uh, which we'll talk about later on that that can fall under. Um, I think maybe if once we go through all of them, um, if you still are confused, we can, we're going to open up the floor again for questions, um, but we can go through all of them and you can see where it fits. And then okay. if you still it's, are, it's, yeah. Okay. It's neither of those, but I, I can wait if there's not a good answer yet. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we have time for one more, I believe. Uh, next person is Mary Jo Georgiev. Mary Jo, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. I have a question. I just renewed my license a couple of weeks ago. So from what I'm hearing, I can use the traditional model CE for this year, 2023, but then starting in January 1st of 2024, I have to switch to the CPD model. Is that correct? Um, not quite. So since you already renewed this year, so the purpose of that um, rule that we put in the regulations that you could use a traditional CE model or CPD to renew for 2023. Um, so since you've already renewed uh, moving forward, you should be using the CPD model. Uh, for this year and until I renew in 2025, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Oh, All right. I guess we should maybe add, I'm not sure where you know when your license actually expires but something that was addressed before is let's say you renewed a couple of weeks ago but your license doesn't expire till uh, march 30th then anything you do between now and then is not going to count it starts the day after your official license renewal thank you okay Thank you. So moving to the next activity is attendance at a California Board of Psychology meeting. So attendance um, at a full board or a committee meeting counts and record of this activity includes the date of the meeting, the name of the meeting and number of hours attended. Uh, for in-person meetings, there will be a sign-in and sign-out sheet by the entrance where licensees will be able to provide their first and last name, your license number, your time of arrival, and time of departure from the meeting. For meetings that are held on WebEx, signing into the WebEx is, is considered the sign-in sheet. So just to give an example of the WebEx, uh, once you sign in, you're going to enter your name and then your license number, if you could fit that in there, um, and then an email address. So a maximum of eight hours can be credited. One day of a board or committee meeting is six hours credited. And for board or committee meetings that are three hours or less, one hour of attendance equals one hour credited. Okay, so we can 
open up the floor for questions. And again, just to remind um, those who have questions that if it could be related to this specific learning uh, CPD category, if it's on another category, we will have time later in this webinar to answer those general questions. And then if we can limit for it to uh, one question per person. Thank you. All right, and the first person to uh, be in line to ask a question is Naga Kasarabada. I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone and you're unmuted. Hi, uh, this is Naga. Thanks for taking my question. I wanted to ask if I already have my sponsored CEUs for law and ethics and uh, I want to use today's hours towards the board of psychology meeting as three hours. Can I do that? Today's um, program falls under self-directed learning. It, it's not an official board of psychology meeting, or, you know, okay. full board okay. or committee. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And regarding the conference attendance, uh, one uh, point I, I just want to emphasize for everyone listening in is we can acquire uh, CEUs only for conferences that have concurrent sessions. It cannot be, for example, uh, say an Asian American conference and all day you have just two presentations, uh, one three hour and then another three hour. Uh, my understanding when I initially called and clarified on this, it's it has to be concurrent sessions a concurrent session conference, right? Um, well, it's, um, if, if it's, a, if the programs that you're getting CE type credit for the sponsor, mm -hmm. um, they have to be, uh, they have to be from approved sponsors, APA, CPA, mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. kind. Um, I think the, an actual, if you, spent a day and this is a conference it i think it would fit under convention but let me just make sure i just don't want to say that and not yeah you know, to make sure it doesn't but it could fit under another category because it's psychology related correct yeah definitely psychology related and um I just want to make sure because that that is a very important uh, point of for clarification yeah, it says it says related to the practice of psychology. In the in the wording, so but if that, say if it is not concurrent sessions and it's just you know say we have some key uh, note speaker and just so it says it says multiple concurrent or sequential freestanding presentations. That's good because I just wanted to confirm that. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And our next commenter is Karen Rathburn. Karen, I'm going to send you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. Um, today, when I signed in, I didn't know to put my psychology license. So can I still count this three hours um, for CEUs in that category, this category? Yes, yes, you are still able to count. I know, understand that um, uh, some people may have not done that for this meeting, uh, just in future meetings, if we could do that. Uh, but this one, yes, you'll be able to count it. Thank you. And, and just to clarify, this is this today's training is self directed learning. This is not a California Board of Psychology meeting. And our next commenter is uh, Christopher Stack. Christopher, I'm going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Uh, it's, as far as board meetings are concerned, so any, just to clarify, anything that's three hours or more, that counts as a full day? Yes. It counts as six hours. Okay. It would count as six hours. Yeah, it's, it has to be more than three hours. Because see where it says, if they're three hours or less, then it's hour per hour, one hour of attendance, one hour credited. But if it's more than three hours, 
then it'll count as the full day. Okay, and then if I were to take it or participate in an activity that pertains to both law and ethics and cultural diversity, social justice, can I count that for both? You wouldn't want to double count hours. I think that's critical. So there would have to be a total of eight hours. Right. right, and so if, let's say I did, I don't know, a two hour CE that was both related to cultural diversity and social justice, as well as laws and ethics, can I count that as checking off that box of, yeah, it's two hours of laws and ethics and two hours of cultural diversity? Well, that would be double pertaining. counting. That would be double counting? It would be double counting. Yes. Okay. And then really quick too, um, I'm building a tool called trackcpd.com to help track these hours. If I want to have the board review it to make sure that it's in line with the regulations, who would I talk to about that? Uh, you can email me. My my email will be displayed at the end of the presentation. I'll have that up for you. Great. Thank you. Thanks. And our next commenter is going to be Marlene Hoffman. Marlene, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Hello? Yes. Um, could you just show this slide again with the sign in for the uh, board meetings? Thank you. I just want to take a picture of that so I know how to sign in when it comes up. That's all. Okay. And our next commenter is Carla Chomka. Carla, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. And you're unmuted. Hello. Oh, hi there. Um, um, this applies to this and other um, CPU uh, or CPD um, activities. If you're late for a meeting, like I was 20 minutes late for this today, uh, do I just count like say two and a half hours or do, do you, I'm, I'm sure I don't know how it's logged. I mean, I don't want to log more hours than I attend, but if you're late, can you even like in say this situation or a, 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 cal, a, a board of psychology meeting, I assume you just put down the amount of time you were there. Yes, that is correct. If you um, weren't there for the full duration from start time um, to finish, you would just put, you would just use the hours or, or the amount of time you attended. Okay, and, and just to clarify, you don't have to, we don't have to list, say, all the presenters or et cetera, right, or who's attending. I'm not certainly if they're the, um, not everybody attending, but does it, do we have to list any names to verify or anything like that? No, for okay. your records, you would just include the date of the meeting, the name of the meeting, and the number of hours attended. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're going to go to our next CPD category, which is academic and um, activities under academic is academic coursework, academic slash sponsored approved continuing education instruction, supervision, publications, and self-directed learning. So under academic coursework, um, so academic coursework is completing a doctoral level course record of this activity is a transcript with evidence of a C or higher or a pass. A maximum of 18 hours can be credited to this activity. The course can only be taken once during the renewal period. So one semester unit course equals six hours credited and one quarter unit course equals four and a half hours credited. So I'm going to open up the floor for questions regarding academic coursework. Thank you. This is the moderator. And our first request to comment is from Eric Samuels. Eric, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Oh, question. I apologize. That's not germane to the slide. I've been trying to ask this question for some time now. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, that I, uh, I really like the CPD model. So I, I'm appreciative to the Board of Psychology for all their work on it. Um, I also, I'm really appreciative 
um, of the, uh, the 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 webinar today, the the ability to have questions asked and answered. But I think what is coming up for me about this is that you know, in my opinion, there's a lot more questions that people have. Uh, about this, and I think this is, you know, subjectively quite confusing for a lot of people and like, you know, yeah, there's close to 800 people on this uh, workshop webinar today, but there's thousands of licensed psychologists in the state. And I guess I'm just concerned about the Board of Psychology's ability to kind of continue um, responding to all of the um, licensees questions about this you know, in the in the future. So I'm hoping to hear more about how the Board of Psychology um, is planning on responding uh, to the, I think, the heavy inflow of questions and concerns that are going to come, you know, over the next few months and years. And, you know, administrative wait times has been a, a concern amongst a lot of licensees, you know, administrative wait times at the Board of Psychology. I had to do a CE audit a little over a year ago, and I had a question about, you know, one of my CE certificates, uh, and despite my efforts to, you know, uh, correspond with the Board of Psychology about it, I never got any response. So, I'd like to hear just more about how the Board of Psychology is planning on um, responding to the, I think, uh, assumed uh, influx of questions that are going to continue to come uh, about this new model. In this transition, thank you. Well, Eric, um, we you will see very soon. There will be a um, an FAQ put out based on a lot of these questions that we're getting. Um, uh, the board is also going to be working with CPA because we know CPA probably gets a number of questions too, and um, definitely we'll be providing. Updates, you make a good point. Certainly, there are nuanced questions that come up. And as we implement this, we will find those. And I were committed to um, providing as much information as we can to make it as easy as possible for our licensees to comply with this. And our next request for comment is from Robert Cipriano. Robert, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Uh, you know, the robust questions in, in detail with the program. Um, I'm very uh, appreciative and, and very enlightened on this. Um, my one question is, <clears throat> my license expires at the end of uh, this year uh, in the fall. And if I choose the traditional, um, I just recently got licensed. I live in Florida. And I'm licensed in California and Florida. If I do the traditional, how would this um, particular uh, CE be counted? In what category? I, I just want to double check that. And thank you. If you do the traditional, um, academic coursework isn't an acceptable form of CE. Mm -hmm. For so... this webinar? He's talking about this webinar. Uh, Oh, the webinar. Okay. Um, it wouldn't be counted. I mean, you could count this because there are a lot with, let me slow down <laughs> with the traditional CE. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a lot ethics requirement. There's no hour requirement. It's just keeping yourself updated. So you could um, use this to complete the laws and ethics requirement, but no hours would be uh, contributed to this traditional CE. So it, uh, basically, it would fall under the laws and rules, but it would be would it be three hours or no? Right. So for traditional CE, there's no hour requirement for laws okay. and ethics. So it's okay. just keeping yourself updated. Okay. Okay. So I could still utilize that, and then when we do the CPD, um, you know, if I you know elect to do that in 2024 after this year, it would count as three hours. Yeah, if you, uh, so we are going to be posting the recording. So after your expiration date, if you viewed the recording, um, you would be able to count. But, it would not, but it would not be attendance today. You'd have to view right. the recording after your expiration date. 
Right, 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 right. But it would be three hours under CPD. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So you answered both of those and I appreciate it. So thank you. Sorry. I move forward. Okay. So let's go to the next activity, which is um, academic instruction or sponsored approved continuing education instruction. So academic instruction means teaching a doctoral level course and sponsored approved CE instruction means teaching a sponsored CE course, whether in person or online that relates to the practice of psychology. Record should include the course syllabus, title of course, name of institution, and dates of instruction. A maximum of 18 hours can be credited towards this activity, and one quarter or semester academic course equals 18 hours credited. Now I'm going to open up the floor. If we can just have questions specifically on academic sponsored approved CE instruction, and then at the end of the presentation will have an opportunity for attendees to ask questions, uh, general questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. This is the moderator. And again, these are questions related to the learning activity number two, academic, academic sponsor approved continuing instruction. And Christopher Stack, I'm gonna send you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. Thank you. Yeah. So if I was, if I were in, in teaching a CE course, um, under where it says to document the hours, let's say I only taught the CE once or twice, um, but the hours only count for quarter or semester. So I'm a little confused on how I would count that. Can you clarify, or maybe I'm misunderstanding this. If you're teaching a course, that's going to be a semester or a quarter course, and you've got your credits for that. If you're teaching just a sponsor approved CE instruction, you know, a one hour or a two hour seminar or something that's um, going to be by APA, that's going to be, that's when you're going to want to count your hours for that. Just by the hour then for that? Correct. Thank you. And our next request for comment is from Melissa Hofstetter. Melissa, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. And Melissa, you can go ahead. Okay, great. Um, my question is specific to if we're providing CEs for camps, uh, if we're doing something for marriage and family therapists, wondering if uh, that might count for providing CEs. So the academic, are you referring to the academic instruction or sponsored approved CEs? Um, I was thinking sponsored approved CEs. I mean, I have another question for, um, for if we teach a course, but I think you've been pretty clear on that. Um, I, I do teach a doctoral class um, that's a quarterly one, but I'm curious if teaching CEs through um, a marriage and family sponsored uh, activity would count for CEs for us. Yeah, the sponsored CE just has to be approved by um, board recognized entities such as APA, uh, CPA, the Association of Black Psychologists, uh, California Medical Association, and the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education. Okay. And that, that list will be provided uh, once we get to sponsored CE. But later not necessarily, in this thank you, not necessarily. Um, Camped or something like that, or the Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. No. Okay. Thanks so much. And our next request for comment is from Andrea Glasser Doss. Andrea, I'm going to send you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. About uh, the academic instruction, um, when you were reading it, you had said that it ha it means teaching a doctoral level class, but on the slide it says teaching a graduate level course. 
So is teaching a, a, a graduate level master's course in either clinical or counseling psychology, does that meet this requirement? You know, uh, 2914B, where it refers to that, is talking specifically about being licensed as a psychologist, qualifying for licensure as a psychologist. I see. Okay. So, so a master, a terminal master's teaching a course in a terminal master's program would not meet this requirement. Correct. I see. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And our next request for comment is from Guy Albert. Guy, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Yes, thank you. Um, I am a faculty member at a, um, a psychoanalytic uh, association, and we are approved by CMA to offer CME, uh, continuing medical, uh, medical ed uh, education units. And I think you might have answered my question, but I'm still unsure how to um, I, what I teach is a case conference, and uh, I think this would qualify as academic sponsored activity as well as a case uh, case conference activity. Could you help me understand where this might go? Um, so it sounds that like you're saying that the course that you're teaching is a course approved by the California Medical Association, correct? Yes. So then yeah, you would be able to count that under uh, the CPD activity. Okay. And just to keep in mind, a maximum of 18 hours can be credited. It would be to counted activity. under academic or uh, academic sponsored approved continuing education, right? Instruction under instruction. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And our next commenter in line is Sherry Campbell. Sherry, I'm sending you a request to unmute. And Sherry, did you see the pop up come up on your mobile device? Oh, you're unmuted. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So I, I've been in line for quite a while. So <clears throat> I'm just curious about the dates. I know everything starts in January. My my subs you know my renewal period is 21 to 23, and in that time I've published a book and signed a contract on another one. Can I use those? So publications. We'll be talking about that. That is an acceptable um, CPD activity, and we'll talk about that. In okay, I'm just, just curious, sites. like, is it acceptable for those contracts and books happen between 21 and now, and my renewal date is April 2023, I just, can I use those? Hours um, have to be after January 1st. So, again, I'll just talk about publications in the next couple slides. Okay. So, you can see exactly what I'm referring to. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll move on to the next activity, um, which is supervision. So overseeing the professional experience of a trainee who is accruing hours towards licensure as a psychologist, marriage and family therapist, licensed clinical social worker, licensed professional clinical counselor, licensed educational psychologist, or physician and surgeon. Record should include dates of supervision and a trainee identifier. A maximum of 18 hours can be credited towards supervision and 1 hour of supervision equals 1 hour credited. I did want to um, again. Uh, just point out that it is for trainees who are accruing hours towards licensure. So practicum students, if since they're not accruing hours towards licensure, supervising practicum students would not be considered a CPD activity. Okay, so 
We're going to open up the floor for questions regarding supervision. Thank you. This is the moderator and the first person uh, is Esther Brass. Esther, I'm sending a request to unmute. You're unmuted. Can you Esther? hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, if the licensure is not in California, either in another state or abroad, is that okay or does it have to be California? Um, I'm so asking that, because I supervise uh, at a university and some people will be moving out of state. That is a very good question. I'm going to defer to my panelists. Um, Maybe Heather could tell us if the regulations state something about that. So, because the, the supervision means overseeing the, you know, the professional experience, you could be supervising someone who is accruing hours towards licensure uh, in California, but then decides not to stay in California. They could go out to Texas or something like that. So, so yes, it as long as they are accruing li hours towards licensure generally, mm -hmm. then what happens ultimately to them is is a separate matter. But as okay. long as during the course of, of your supervision, they are accruing a license hour, they're accruing hours towards licensure. That's okay. that works. Okay, great. Thank you. And our next commenter is Kimberly. Kimberly, I'm sending you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, I I suspect this is not going to count, but among other things, I um, I work for the state and we hire a number of unlicensed providers for the prison system. And I supervise a group of unlicensed psychologists who are working towards EPPP licensure. So I help them with uh, EPPP preparation and academic preparation. Does that count for anything? Would that count here or no? It sounds is that part of your fee for service? Because CPD, remember, in most cases is separate and apart from your fee for service activities. So it sounds like it's um, under an earlier category, not under academic supervision necessarily, but maybe under um, professional services. But the other um, one I was wondering, it, it's something I do over and above. It, it's not part of my job. It's just something I do because we want to help our people get licensed. I see. Um, yeah. It, it sounds like um, it would as long as, you know, they're accruing hours towards licensure mm -hmm. and they're not using this just as an, as an experience. Um, and not just how to study for the E triple P. No, it is so. more academic preparation, reviewing subject areas and, and things like that. Yeah, and they're using it for hours towards licensure. That's a key piece to it. Then yes, it, it sounds like it would count. Okay, thank you. No, I, I just want to ask, as you do this though, you're saying that you're doing this not in a supervisory mode. It's not like a formal supervisory mode. Is that correct? It's a, a volunteer service that you're providing. My apologies. I have muted the question. Okay, asker. I think that's an important part of it. Um. All right, and so my apologies, but we're moving on to the next commenter, Megan Sarah. Megan, I'm going to send you a request to unmute. Okay. And uh, Andrea, I'm going to send you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. Yes, Andrea. Yes, okay. Um, 
I asked this earlier and then you, you guys said it'll come up again later. So I'm still confused. Um, if I am supervising a group of, um, uh, so, uh, MFT associates who are counting the hour, um, can I count that? So this is part of a formalized supervision. Is that correct? Yes, like they're at our site as a associate for their hours to get licensed. Yeah, seems like it would fit into this academic supervision. Perfect. And one more, the double counting of ethics. And I don't understand the double counting piece. Um, you've mentioned that a few times, but if you get it through a category, isn't that, that's not double counting it. Right? So if you're, if you are going to take an, let's say an eight hour course that happens to cover cultural diversity and or social justice and law and ethics, then you're getting four hours in each. But it does say this eight hour requirement. So you couldn't take a four hour course that covered law and ethics and also col covered cultural diversity and use that because it's just four hours. It wouldn't satisfy the requirement. It's got to be a total of eight but, hours. Okay, but I could count it as like an independent study and then also count it as ethics, right? Um, I'd have to ask Liselle. Oh, that I is studying. Yes. So Liselle, you're saying yes, they can do that. That the eight that that course could be part of their sponsored CE or independent study. And and yes, just like today's self-directed learning also counts as law and ethics. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to the next CPG category, which is publications. So publications means um, authoring or co-authoring peer-reviewed journal articles, book chapters, books, or editing or co-editing a book related to psychology or a related discipline. Record includes either a letter of acceptance for publication or proof of publication with publication date in the renewal period for which it is being submitted. A total of, uh, or I'm sorry, a maximum of nine hours can be credited and one publication equals nine hours credited. So I'm gonna open up the floor for questions regarding publications. And our first person requesting comment is Joan Tohi Jacobs. And Joan, I'm sending you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. Joan? Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can. Great. Um, it's sort of related to this topic, but it's it's come up a couple times. Um, I wanted clarification for what is considered like an evaluation activity. Um, in my role, um, most of what I do is uh, I work for a county behavioral health department in the research unit. So I'm mostly involved in doing evaluation and research activities. So I'm trying to see where any of what I do fits. Um, I, I saw something mentioned about, you've mentioned a couple of times, not something not counting if it was a fee for service activity and i'm not sure what that means um it sounds like a lot of these activities are people are being compensated for their work so i'm trying to see where that um how that would work yes so the fee for service was specifically for professional services so um your involvement in the organization you shouldn't be receiving a fee for that to sit on the board or the committee. Uh, that was what we were referring to. So none of that work in research and evaluation counts as a CPD? Uh, research and evaluation, it could probably, it sounds like it's more self-directed learning. Um, which we will get to in a couple slides. Sure. All right. 
And our next request for comment is from Hannah Levinson. Hannah, I'm going to send you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. If you showed the next slide, I could see how many units. Okay, so nine hours credited maximum. So if I'm having a book published and several articles published, and some of them are dealing with laws, ethics, cultural diversity as part of the book, um, there may be a way to just add up all these hours and parse them out. How, how would I do that? Yeah, just to um, reiterate what was said earlier is we don't want to double count that. So right. if let's say you did um, a peer reviewed journal article on laws and ethics, uh, yeah, yeah, you would be able to count this for hours, but let's say it's like a mixture of both. You're saying it's a mixture of both laws and ethics and cultural diversity. Yes, within the book, there are sections in the book on diversity, on ethics as applied to the subject matter, et cetera. So it's not purely uh, the whole book is not on laws and ethics. The whole book is not on diversity, but there are certainly sections in there. Could uh -huh. I divide up the nine hours? I, I wouldn't double count. The, the, um, the, rule on the law and ethics and cultural diversity does talk about a training. Um, and so maybe Heather can help us interpret since it says training on and would that fit in this category? And we also want to remember that these um, authoring these author, these books or chapters or journal articles has to have occurred after January 1 of 2023. All the work could have been done prior, but if the publication date is after January, that would meet the requirement. Right, right, right. So okay. I'm wondering, Heather, could you help us with that on the train, the word training? Right, and and again, if, if you're doing the, the book on, on cultural justice or uh, social issues, you could use four hours there and four hours ethics on on your self directed learning that you did for the book. Um, but uh -huh. oh, I you see. Want, you want to be giving. You know, if you're taking the training, then that's a separate topic. So, okay. Heather, are we required to take a training or not? Since it's the way that the wording is. Do, are we required to do that or can we integrate that into some of these other categories? I believe the language of, of the regulations said take the training. So that would be something that you are you are inputting, not outputting. Okay. 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 Um, thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next CPD activity, which is self-directed learning. And self-directed learning is independent educational activities focused on maintaining, developing, or increasing conceptual and applied competencies that are relevant to psychological practice, education, or science, such as reading peer-reviewed journal articles or books, watching videos or webcasts, or listening to podcasts. Record includes the dates, the medium, so if it's a webinar, uh, I'm sorry, a webcast or a podcast, the topic of or title, and the total number of hours. A maximum of six hours can be credited, and one hour at, of activity equals one hour uh, credited. I just want to also point out that if you took a an approved CE, uh, CE course um, approved by APA, for example, and let's say you, you took more um, than the maximum of 27 hours in sponsored CE, you can't apply those hours to self-directed learning. So self-directed learning is for non-approved courses. Okay, so now we're just going to open up the floor for some questions regarding self-directed learning. Thank you, and this is the moderator. We're going to start with uh, Megan Sayre. 
Megan, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Uh, my question is actually piggybacking off of what was just said about law and ethics a moment ago. So applying specifically to the self-directed learning category, could we, for example, read a book on social justice or and or cultural diversity to meet that requirement in this category? Yes. So reading a book about those topics uh, um, listed in cultural diversity or social justice could be under self-directed learning. Thank you. And our next question is from Felissa Quartner. Felissa, I'm going to send your request to unmute. You're unmuted. Hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So my um, question is related to the um, law and ethics and cultural diversity in relation to any of the other categories. It's my understanding that um, we can get credit for law and ethics or cultural diversity. It doesn't have to necessarily be a training, but it has to, it can be in any of the four CPD categories. Is that correct? So it could be, for example, self-directed learning. It could be sponsored continuing education. It could be part of an academic course that you're either taking or um, providing. That is absolutely correct. Okay, I think that clarifies it um, for me. Thank you so much. And our next request for comment, or comment is from Linda Radbill. Linda, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Um, so I have a question that kind of crosses a couple different areas, I think. Um, I am presenting at a conference and um, I'm wondering where I would put those hours for like creating the presentation, but also that presentation ends up being published in a journal. And so I'm wondering if that also counts in the last um, CPD learning activity. So it sounds like the preparation for the meeting or the presentation could be under self-directed learning. And then if it was published as, oh, uh, that, but, so the publishing, you're meaning like, is the publications is more of text from what I'm reading from the regulations. Right, so, I think they just published the abstract of, you know, the presentation itself. Right, so that would just be separate, um, at, and then it would be kind of considered double dipping because okay. it's one activity should follow under uh, should go under one CPD activity. So, okay, so that self directed learning would make the most sense. Right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And we're going to take uh, one more question regarding self directed learning before we move on to the next CPD activity. Right, so our last commenter for this section is Shaye Diallo. Shaye, I'm sending you a request to unmute. And you're unmuted. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, so I just have a quick question. I, I know you kind of reviewed it, but I just want to make sure. So if I, um, attended this presentation, which is three hours, and then the one that was just, you know, not too long ago, um, the first presentation, that was two hours, so a total of five. Um, those would fall under self-directed, but when I go um, just for auditing purposes to include the four hours for law and ethics, how would I um, kind of notate that, that four of the five were for law and ethics and then the one was also for the, the extra one hours for self-directed in, in addition. Yes, yeah, so you can write that in the C. So in our CPD reporting form under self-directed learning, you could just put a little notation there for your records. Um, 
but it'll also be understood because you would use under self-directed using you put the dates and then the topic or title so like if you were audited i would be able to see oh you're talking about the cpd webinar okay wonderful and, and just okay. Yes, that makes perfect sense. And just one quick question about the consultation. I, I know you said that the Facebook didn't count, but if we're doing a um, phone consultation for peer consultation or case consultation, that would count, correct? Right, it's done in real time. Um, yes. Then, yeah, it would, it would count. Okay, thank you so much um, for the presentation. Oh, thanks. All right, we'll move on to the next CPD activity, which is sponsored continuing education. So this is CPD learning activity or category number three. Um, and CPD, so sponsored continuing education is basically the traditional CE model that you're familiar with. Uh, courses must be approved by either CPA, APA, uh, Association of Black Psychologists, California Medical Association and or the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Evaluation. A record of this activity is proof of attendance provided by the sponsor. So basically the CE certificates that you guys typically receive. Uh, for this activity, you can do a maximum of 27 hours and one hour of the activity equals one hour credited. Uh, for this activity, even though it is the traditional CE model, um, you there is no live requirement for this. So you can do the full 27 um, asynchronous or synchronous or a mixture of both. Okay, so we can open up the floor for questions regarding sponsored continuing education. Wonderful. So this is the moderator and we'll go in order. First is Jeremy Bartz. Jeremy, I'm sending you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. Is about overlap here. So like, I'll give you a hypothetical situation. So if I, I recently, I did a um, sponsored continuing education for, it was like psychedelic assisted therapy. And that was the general topic, but there were, you know, a lot of subcategories and a significant percentage of it was dedicated to cultural diversity and um, social justice. And so the whole thing was 15 hours. So would part of that be able to count as the four hour requirement for uh, cultural uh, diversity and social justice? And then the 15 hours is 15 hours of, um, you know, sponsored continuing education. So, yeah, sorry about that. So you were asking if you can complete the laws and ethics, the required training, the laws and ethics and social justice uh, through sponsored continuing education. Yeah, if if there was like, like, let's say 14, uh, sorry, not 14, four of the 15 hours of the that teaching was dedicated to um, well, let's say two hours of it was dedicated to cultural diversity. Could that, and then the uh, the other 15 hours were not related to cultural diversity. The other, well, sorry, it's a total of 15 hours. So the other 13 hours were not related to cultural diversity. Could those two hours that were dedicated to cultural diversity um, fulfill two of the four required hours? Yes, so we wouldn't count. So, for your example, when you said the 15 hour course, you would only count the hours that were specifically covering cultural diversity. So, yes, the two hours would count towards that. And then how to notate it is um, I would just keep record with your certificate. So, like, let's say if you were using the CPD reporting form and you listed all the courses or however, you know, um, all the CE courses you took, you can put a notation by that to say two of these were cultural diversity. Okay, two were cultural diversity, and then it's not, ne oh, oh, I'm sorry, hold on. And then it's not necessary to, I can still count the 15 total towards the 27 allowed, is that right? Yes. Okay, perfect, thank you so much. 
And our next request for comment is from Elisa Gambino. Elisa, I'm going to send you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. And go ahead, Elisa. Elisa, we're not hearing your voice. Elisa, if you can choose a different either headset, speakers, microphone. I'm sorry, we're still not hearing you, Elisa. All right, unfortunately, we're going to need to move on to Sophia Herrera. Sophia, I've sent you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. Um, I actually have a question about the uh, activities in the under the academic category. It seems like some of the other activities in other be in, in consultation, for example, um, should not be a fee for service. However, um, a lot of the courses that people teach. Uh, in graduate uh, institutions or doctoral programs are uh, basically paid uh, services. So can you clarify that, please? Yeah, so the um, fee for service, that one was specifically for professional services. So that's where you were, uh, if you were part of a Psychological Association Board or Committee, um, those those activities you should not get paid for to count for CPD. It was just specific to that CPD activity. I see. Thank you very much. And and just to also piggyback on that, um, the academic coursework and academic uh, instruction. Uh, those, you can only count one course per renewal period. So let's say you are a professor um, and you're doing this, you know, for both fall and, and spring, you can only count the course one time for your renewal period, for each renewal period. Okay, so we're going to jump to the next and the last CPD um, category, which is the ABAP or the board certification. So ABAP board certification counts for 100%, so 36 hours of the required CPD in the renewal cycle in which the certification is awarded. And the senior option ABAP board certification counts for 50%, which is 18 hours of the required CPD in the renewal cycle in which the certification is awarded. So this only is for the, um, the renewal cycle in which it's awarded, so not the uh, renewing of it. That makes sense. Um, so record should include proof of the specialty certification. Okay, so we're gonna just open up the floor for questions regarding board certification. All right, and we do have Shira back. Sure, I'm going to send you another request to unmute. Um, are there opportunities with the board to expand the diversity of people who are getting AB, big ABPP certified? Because it seems to be um, very heavily leaning towards non diverse individuals. Are you if talking? Are you talking that about is, as that is going to be something that we that we can count? Um, is that going to be? Is are there efforts towards diversifying the ABPP um, certificate certi certi certificates or those oh. who are certified? You know that that would be um, a good uh, question to talk with ASPPB since. Um, they uh, they would be they would have uh, our board 
is California, and we don't have input on that. Does that answer what you're asking? It, it does. Um, it just, it seems as though that um, then this is, it creates a, a discriminatory process wherein if this board is being, is, is one of the ways in which people can count it towards our certified professional development and it heavily leans away from people of color, then it seems to be some a place of discrimination within the board. I'd just like to, note that and maybe somebody here with the CPA can note that and with the Board of Psychology can note how that then creates a discriminatory practice. Yeah, thank you for awesome. bringing that up. I think that's helpful. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And our next request for comment is from Danielle Netto. Danielle, I'm going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. Is actually You're related. Oh, so thank you. Uh, my question's related to the sponsored continuing education. Um, I just wanted to clarify if my renewal period is in 2023, can I count um, sponsored continuing education I accrued in 2022 on the CPD form if I choose to do the CPD route? Yes, yes, you can. Because um, the sponsored continuing education is the traditional model. So hours that you accrued in 2022 can be applied to 2023 if you chose to renew using CPD. Um, again, but with this, it's only a maximum of 27 hours can be used. So I could do a combination of both the other categories and some of the um, sponsor continued education captured there. Right, so you would need to, okay. it would be required to. Yeah, so you're yeah. gonna need, if you use CPD, you're gonna need it to use at least two of the four categories mm -hmm. um, to, to renew. Perfect. All right, great. These are some great questions you guys are having. So I'm just gonna move forward with the presentation and then after this, we'll have um, some time to answer some questions. Okay, so here we have the CPD reporting form. It is a useful resource to help maintain record of your activities, and you can download this on the board's website, which is psychology.ca.gov. Uh, licensees must retain CE records for four years, and you will only need to furnish it to the board if you are selected for a CE audit. So uh, for CE audits, just want to kind of go over what that is. And um, when renewing, licensees certify under penalty of perjury that they have completed the 36 hours required for renewal. The board conducts audits on two and a half to 10% of the renewing population every month. Licensees are randomly selected. The randomly selected licensees are notified they are being audited through letters that are sent the, the United States Postal Service, as well as emailed. The audit requires licensees to submit the verification of 36 hours to the board within 60 days. It is important that you verify you have a current address on file with the board. And although you are not required to provide the board with an email, it is beneficial to have one as we do send out notification via email. Uh, you can update your information on Breeze. So Breeze, the website for that is breeze.ca.gov. So for audit, there are three outcomes. You're in compliance, you receive an educational letter, and or you could get a citation and fine. So what is a citation and fine? It is an alternative method by which the board can impose a sanction and take an enforcement action against a licensed or unlicensed individual who was found to be in violation of the psychology licensing law. The or, uh, there are two parts in a citation and fine, an order of abatement and a fine. So the order of the abatement, order of abatement requires you to make up the hours that you are short and the fine ranges from $500 to $2,500. You are able to contest the citation by requesting an informal conference. Um, it would be held telephon 
through uh, via telephone with myself and the executive officer, Antoinette Sorek. Uh, the purpose of the conference is to give you the opportunity to present any additional information that may be relevant to the decision as to whether the citation and fine should be modified, withdrawn, or affirmed. You also have the option of requesting a formal hearing, and it does can take up to a year to hold a formal hearing. So a citation, it does stay on your license or in public record for five years. Uh, the citation fine must be paid in order to renew your license, but the citation doesn't affect your ability to practice. So this concludes my presentation. Um, if you have any specific questions regarding CPD, please email me at bobce at dca.ca.gov. Um, and just a reminder, attending this training gives you CPD credit. So three hours in laws and ethics under the category of self-directed learning. So now we're gonna open up the floor for general questions. Thank you. And so the first person who's got a hand up for a question is Jody Adewale. Jody, I'm going to send your request to unmute. You're unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello, hello. Yes. Yes. Just a quick question about the form, the CPD form. We're not submitting that form when we renew our license. We're just holding on to that till we get audited. Right, yeah, when you renew your license, if you renew using Breeze, you do have the option of uploading your documents and the form, but you don't need to furnish it to the board unless you're uh, selected for an audit. Okay, cool. And the other question was, what was the thought process in switching up to the CPD system? Yeah. So we just followed the model from the Association of State and Provincial Psychology Boards. They presented a new model of continuing education back in 2012. Got gotcha. you. So Thank you so much. It. Yeah. You're welcome. And then our next comment comes from David Joel Patterson. I'm sending you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. Is the CPD learning category number three the only way to get the six hours required for supervision? For that, um, from my understanding from the regulations, the licensing regulations, it specifies six hours in supervision coursework. Uh -huh. um, but I'm going to defer to the panelists to know because I'm not familiar with the licensing um, regulations. Uh, that may be a question I have to get back to you on when I talk to the licensing manager, but I just want to check if my uh, panelists. So, David, are, are you saying to get the um, six hours of supervision of CE that you need for to continue as a supervisor? Is that what you're asking about or yes. to get credit as a supervisor? Yeah, no, yes, Mary, that, that's right. To be able to be a, a supervisor for others. Okay. Yeah. So that would be a question. I think that the licensing manager, we'd have to clarify with, because we'd want to look at the regulations unless Heather knows them off the top of her head and can tell us now um, to see what those regulations actually say. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have that particular set of regulations at my fingertips right now, so it would be better to make sure we have the right answer. Okay, okay. Thank you. back to you, David. And that is sorry to interrupt Ms. Fisher. I was just going to say that that's a good question for the FAQ that we will be uh, posting shortly. Wonderful. And our next questioner is Mark Loesch. And Mark, I'm sending you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I had a question about practice outcome monitoring. It was, we talked about it earlier. Um, the example was given of using the PHQ-9. So 
if I give an example, like I see a patient for say a 60 minute session and I administer the PHQ-9. Uh, now, the PHQ-9 only takes a few minutes to administer. So I'm not sure how that would be counted. Would that, if it's an hour long session and I administer the PHQ-9 for six uh, of those therapy sessions, even though the PHQ-9 only takes a few minutes to administer, would that be counted as an hour for each of those six hours? Do you follow my question? Yes, I, so for that, um, with administering the test, we don't have, uh, a list of acceptable tests, right? But um, I think it's not only administering it, it sounds also as if the regulations make it sound as if it's also just, um, uh, the word just slipped in my mind. Uh, analyzing? Assessing, yes, analyzing. <laughs> there you go, thank you. Um, analyzing the test as well, and that does, take quite a bit of time. Yeah, it would be evaluating the outcome and and then theoretically adjusting your work with that person based on that the outcome measures. And and don't forget that practice outcome monitoring does have a maximum time per client that can be claimed. Yes. Right. But and, so and you, you would want to be sure too that the um, measure you chose has been um, has been validated for cultural sensitivity and diversity. Right, but so if I'm following you, I'm administering the instrument and then incorporating the results of the assessment into my work. So basically, all of that could be counted. So if I see the, I administer the assessment. I look at the results, I incorporate that work into my 60 minute session. So in that way, you could count an hour for practice outcome monitoring. Is that? Yes, up to nine hours maximum. So let's say you, you pick just one patient and that's who you did throughout the year, just that one patient. But you, um, in, in the process of administering, scoring, interpreting, and and using that information, perhaps writing it up, um, it might add up to nine hours. But you might do that with two or three. It's just a nine hour maximum. Okay. All right. With Thank one, you. With one hour per patient. Yeah, you get one hour credited per patient. Yeah. Okay. In, in other words, yeah. Uh, is there a maximum of one hour per patient? In other words, I couldn't do nine hours with one patient? Correct. Right. You'd have to have nine separate patients. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And our next request for comment is from Sharon Singleton. Sharon, I'm sending a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. We have two questions. Um, the first is the audit tool, I mean, the the CPD tool on the website doesn't work right. Um, is that going to be fixed? And if it doesn't, do, is that what we do? We have to use that, or can we just make a spreadsheet? And my second question is: so I direct a practicum program, and I know I can't count those supervision hours under supervision because it's not towards licensure. Where can I count those supervision hours? Okay, so to um talk about the CPD reporting form. If you yeah. could just email me what issues maybe okay. there's anything that you're having, because it's also a PDF. So you can transfer that into a, a Word document or an Excel sheet, or you can create your own. It's just, it's not something you're required to use. Okay. Thanks. Um, and then you said for the supervision, you're supervising. Can you repeat that question again? Yeah, I direct a practicum program and I do a lot of supervision on assessment and um, therapy with many different practicum students, and I don't know how to where to count those hours, or if I can, because I know right. I can't count them as supervision. Is there somewhere else I can count them? 
unfortunately, no, that's that is not an acceptable CPD activity. Okay. Do you know what the logic with that is? Because they are going to be licensed at some point. Well, probably part of the logic is that um, we don't count those hours in the required hours to obtain licensure. Right. No, I get that, but I'm wondering why that isn't some kind of academic activity because that's integral to our trainees. I mean, they have to do that in order to graduate and get licensed. Right. Yeah, it, the regulations are written at accruing hours towards licensure and since so there's nowhere else I could count those those activities that I do with them. What their their supervision of of practicum students, right? It's supervision. It's consulting with them on. I mean, I'm I'm working with them on assessment cases. I'm working with them on individual cases, just like you would supervise any trainee. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm thinking about. I'm wondering. Um, but it's a really I count question. that as consultation. Well, here Heather's going to give us some clarification. Okay, <laughs> I don't think it would be consultation because they're not a licensed mental health professional at that point. But one of the things that the the regulations do is encourage people to do something a little bit outside of their regular day to day paid activities. Well, and so if this is part of your job, then then that's what you're already doing. And CPD, the the idea is to to get a little more outside that bubble. Okay, well, it's actually kind of outside my bubble at work. Um, like nobody else in my job title is doing it. So, I mean, it's at, it's above and beyond for what I do at work. But um, okay, thank you. And our next request for comment is from Diana Hoffman. Diana, I'm sending you a request to unmute. You're unmuted. Or the, related to the supervision hours as well, if I'm conducting a group supervision with four interns um, or, or um, associates, uh, the group supervision is usually two hours, but it counts as one supervision unit because it's a group. Would that count as one hour or two hours for CPD? It, well, it says one hour of supervision is one hour credited. Okay, so if I'm doing a 2 hour group supervision, I could count that as 2. Okay, thank you very much. And our next commenter is Daniel. Oops, screen on the fritz Daniel Kaus. I'm going to send you a request to unmute. Kashansky, thank you. You're unmuted. Great. Um, so I'm calling regarding the law and ethics and social justice. Um, requirements. It says as they apply to the practice of psychology, historically, it was just you need to it the 1st time. Um, I've been done multiple renewals. Do you have to now do it every time or is it only count for the 1st time? And if you're renewing law and ethics and, uh. Social justice, racial justice don't count anymore. What is the requirement? So, this is required for each renewal. Okay. Got them. And that's that's a change, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. And our next uh, person up for question is Jay Weissman Sadek. Jay, I'm sending a request to unmute. You're unmuted. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, related to professional services, um, I'm looking at the the terminology from that slide. Um, uh, I'm not even sure quite how to say this. Um, in terms of program, um, it sounds like there's almost like a term of service with respect to program. And in my specific application on this one, I'm looking at uh, providing service to a, let's say, you know, an APA division in doing conference reviews for their annual conference. And I'm wondering if that fits in there in terms of quote program, or if this is not that category. It seems like it could fit with program development because it's their annual conference. Yeah. Right? 
and you're doing reviews, it could be evaluation activities. And even scientific grant reviews, although it's not a scientific grant. Yeah, it's really like you're reviewing like other people's work and determining if it ought to be in the annual program. And these are, you know, significant entities like PSYOP and the rest. So yeah. I just, it doesn't quite sound right for this section, but I just wanted to check in on this. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm going to look at peer consultation in some way, just in case. Well, do you do this individually? So they, the, the association and effect, you know, like the, 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 enter, the division for their annual conference, APA for their, you know, APA divisional conference sends out a bunch of research for you to review and determine whether or not you and their other reviewers as well believe this should be part of the program. Yeah, I, I sort of see it more under peer consultation because it talks about you can be obtained through individual consultation, reading groups, research groups focused on maintaining, developing, or increasing conceptual and applied competencies relevant to psychological education. Interesting. Okay. That's very interesting. Okay. I can yeah. see that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me let me think about that, but I, I think that's yeah. probably a better direction. I appreciate it. That. Yeah. And our next speaker is Armine Malconian. Armine, I'm sending a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. And go ahead, Armine. Okay, we lost Armine. Uh, we will move on to Sarah Belgrad. Sarah, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, just an overall question. The other day I was renewing my license because uh, it becomes due in May. So during this last renewal period, obviously I was doing traditional CEs. However, on the website, when you go to renew through the breeze, you, the only thing that comes up is is the on that application are the questions about the new CEs. So I had to renew uh, using the PDF paper form and mail it in with a check because on the paper form, if you go on the website and print it out, then it asks you the old questions about the traditional CEs. And I was wondering, is that on purpose or is that just kind of like a glitch and how it is. So if you want to renew, if you want to renew using CPDs, you do the online application. And if you want to renew during doing the traditional, you do the mail-in method. That's a useful question. Lisa, what do you know about that? Yeah. So when we were creating the uh, renewal application for Breeze, uh, the Breeze team wasn't able to differentiate or create two different applications. Mm -hmm. So whether you want to renew as traditional or CPD, you can still renew online using Breeze. Um, the answers, of course, just wouldn't. So if you applied no to cultural diversity and social justice, you know, because it's not a requirement, mm -hmm. um, it, it's not going to hold up your license. It's not going to negatively affect you. Got it. Okay. Answer truthfully. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Can I get Thank that? You. Yeah, that's <laughs> only for those whose license expire in 2023. Thank so. you so much. It's very helpful. Okay. And we're going to loop back, hopefully, to get Armine Melkonian unmuted. And Armine, I've sent you another request. It should come up on your mobile device. Okay, you're unmuted, Armine. We can't hear your voice. And are you changing devices perhaps? Okay, and let me try sending something to your mobile device again. You're unmuted, Armine. We're still not hearing your voice. 
so sorry. All right, let's see. We're going to move on to Karen Shore. Karen, I'm sending you a request to unmute. You're unmuted, Karen. Okay, hi, how are you? Good, thanks. Good. Um, I have a question on professional services. Um, I'm a little confused about, you know, I know it says that credit is given if you're on a committee or board of an organization. Um, the examples are only a psychology organization. So the question really is, um, let's say somebody's on the committee or a board for a multidisciplinary organization or a crisis center or something like that. Will that service on a committee or board still count? I'm looking through it again. Yeah. So it's, it, you said it's a, a like a crisis center and you're on that board. Well, I'm, I'm asking in general for several people, you know, the beginning of the description says um, related to the field of psychology or other related disciplines. Okay, so then I'm thinking, sure, if I'm in an interdisciplinary groups committee, or if I'm at a psychoanalytic institute and on a committee for that institute, or I'm on a committee for a crisis center's uh, board, mm -hmm. um, that that should count. But the example is serving on a psychological association. So it I just, just wanna make sure, you know, in this- um, It just says yeah. including the following, serving right, on Right, but not limited. So in yeah. other words, a multidisciplinary organization or something would still be okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Just wanted to check that. Sure. All right, thanks very much. Yeah. All right, and our next request for comment is from, um, Let's see, I guess, did we lose Mary Frank? All right, so uh, Shireen Rafat, you're up next. I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Oh, Shireen, is this, try once more. And we're not hearing you, Shireen. You're unmuted, but we're not hearing your voice. I will go ahead and try to get back to you. Yeah, my apologies, we're not hearing your voice. All right, next up is Rachel Cavajero. Mm -hmm. Cava Rachel, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. You're unmuted. Hi, I had a question about um, attending conferences. If aside from counting the CEs um, for the specific sessions, if I'm just talking about um, attendance for the day, does it have to be a sponsored um, approved like an approved sponsored uh sessions going on throughout the conference or could it be something related but not necessarily approved by apa or a like agency so you're saying that it's a conference where some of the sessions have um ce approval by apa or cpa but there are some sessions that don't, is that correct? Um, I actually, I don't know if any of them do. Oh. It's related to psychology, but not necessarily approved by APA. Oh. Would I be able to count just the attendance at the conference? Um, let me just look again, Pro professional gathering. Mm -hmm. okay. And sequential yep. freestanding presentations or multiple concurrent, but it's related to psychology. Yes. I don't see why you wouldn't. Okay. That's yeah. all I needed. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. 
And let's go ahead and try and get through with Mary Frank again. Mary, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. And Mary, you're unmuted. But we're not hearing your voice. All right, Mary, we're try one more time. All right, I'm sorry, Mary Frank, we're not able to hear your voice. Okay, we're moving on to Patricia O'Neill. Patricia, I'm sending you a request to unmute your microphone. And Patricia, did you see a pop-up? Okay, got it. Great. We can um, hear you. So uh, I fall into that category of people who are going to have to renew in 2024. And I'm hearing a lot of different dates thrown around. I thought it had been changed so that everybody was going to renew on the 1st of January during the year of their renewal. Do I have that wrong? So your expiration date doesn't change. Um, what we're, we're just referring to is that CPD activities. Uh, no, I understand that, oh. but but I'm hearing people throwing around a lot of different dates. Doesn't everybody renew on the 1st unless it's their first year? No, everybody, um, they have different expiration dates. It's the date that they were initially licensed. Okay. Um, as for right, some, then. and then some are for the end of the month. So then January 6th is after the deadline? And I have to go by the traditional one. So your license, if your license expires in 2024, um, you will use CPD. And then only the CPD. Correct. Okay. And the second question is, it does sound like um, you're really going to be able to do it sort of very close to the same way we've done it before in terms of you know 22 and 23 uh stuff that you did if it's apa approved and so on right that in general there are some changes some expansions actually that i can see how they would uh, apply to competency mm -hmm. but yes. a lot of this stuff we've all all been able to use all along is still going to be able to be used yes Yes, up to 27 credits. Okay. And the second thing is I noticed that a suicide prevention requirement does not appear, or at least I didn't see it. Has that been dropped? So the suicide prevention training was a one-time requirement after your renewal, for your first renewal after January 1st, 2020. Uh, thank you so yeah. much. This was very useful. Thank you. All right, and our next request for comment is from Barry Camille. Barry, I'm soups. Sending you a request to unmute. And Barry, did you get the request? Yep, you're unmuted. Yeah, um, so on the heels of the previous caller, um, just to make sure and reinforce it. So my license comes up for renewal at the end of February in 2024. So then my understanding should be that I have to follow these new guidelines and not the traditional guidelines. That's the only option. Correct. Okay. Yeah, because I've already accumulated a lot of the other ones. All right, thank you. And our next request for comment is from Steve Rosier. Steve, I'm sending you a request to unmute. Hey, hey I got a question okay. for you. It looks like you've gone over the sponsor CE number three, the 27 hours standard uh, required approved hours plus your nine hours, whether it's CPD or traditional, there's just a little a um, ch few changes, but my question is, you know, as we're going on in futuristic here, 
everything is being done uh, on the computer. Everything's being done in cyberspace. Everything's being done by electronics. So will there be, and we, and we do usually get certificates. We get proof that we've attended. We do tests for all these classes that we provide to you for our different hours. Now, will there be a time where all this is just going to be electronically done and everything we're doing like right today? Here I am sitting in front of you again, this wonderful kind of Zoomish uh, atmosphere. Everything is turning into this, right? So everything's going to be eventually just kind of, we're going to be sitting in front of a computer and providing you with this information. Is that correct? Did you get me? Would you say, um, well, um, are you saying without certificates? I mean, I know. No, we, you get certificates when yeah. you're doing online or Zoom right. uh, classes because you get tests back. You take right. the test. Right. You get show that you've done all these APA, CPA, CMA, yeah. et cetera. But all of this is becoming so electronic yeah. that basically we need to set our minds i'm an older person yeah. set our minds towards really just learning the computer and doing all of the requirements they're going to be entered in the computer they're going to be printed out by the computer they're going to be reviewed eventually by you on a computer right i mean this is the electronic age yeah in the meantime i, I when i get audited i i scan all those things and send it in, you know, email it in. So I guess that's an intermediate step, but it would be nice if everything's already somehow in a central data bank, right? And then if we are going to get audited, they can pull that central data bank up and it's all right there. Right. And I do appreciate your answering my question because it gets very frustrating wondering where the world is going and I'm trying to keep up. So thank you very much. Sure. And our next commenter is uh, Karen Avazian. Karen, I'm going to send you a request to unmute. And Karen, did you see something pop up? There you are unmuted. Hello? Yes, hello. Hi. I was wondering in the in the former um, continuing education program, there was an option for like reading the California psychologist or APA journals and taking a test. What will that what category does that fall under in the new system? That would be sponsor approved CE. Okay. All it's right. Thank you. Was. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Our next commenter is Mary Ewart. Mary, I'm sending you a request to unmute. And Mary, did you see a pop-up come up? You're unmuted. Um, I have a question that falls under the professional services category. I volunteer time um, to two committees at my psychoanalytic institute. I'm the co-chair of the ethics committee and I am chair of the CE committee. And I'm wondering where this time uh, is counted. Well, in the ethics committee, we meet once a month and discuss uh, professional ethics in- um, And this uh, is your psychoanalytic uh, association? Yes, yes. So yes, it would be under professional services. Okay. And in terms of, and that also would apply for chairing the CE committee where I review all the forms that people submit requesting CE credit for courses or. Yes. Uh, so if, if you're, if you're in those roles for one year, you can get nine hours of credit, but remember there's a 12 hour maximum during the renewal cycle. So let's say you're in that position for two years. Uh, you still would only get, you know, the two years of your renewal period, um, you would only get 12 hours maximum. Got it. And um, my license renews at the end of this March and I have, I don't know, 30 some 
no, close to 36 hours of uh, traditional CE. But if I'm short of 36, can I use some um, hours in category number one to complete my license renewal? That if I've earned those hours, like in peer consultation from January 1 until this current time? Uh, yeah, I think you can, as long as there's two different categories. Isn't that correct, Lisel? Yeah, if you're using CPD to renew, then yes, you could, you would use two different categories. Um, if you're using the traditional CE model, you can only stick with the traditional CEs. So it's, a, it's only one or the other. Okay, but if I do CPD, then 27 of those traditional CEs could be counted and then the additional nine could come from professional activity. The category one hours there, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. And just to let everyone know that we will be wrapping this webinar up at 415 today. Um, so, again, if you have a question and we weren't able to get to it, please email me. Um, the email is on the screen, bobce at dca.ca.gov. And we have time. I'm going to send Brian Lukacs. I'm sending you a request to unmute. And Brian, did you get the, there you go, you're unmuted. We're not hearing your voice yet. Hello? Yes, now we hear you. Okay, yeah, I apologize. Uh, two quick questions, uh, just to get some clarification. What, what hours count uh, with CPD that were earned uh, prior to uh, January 1 of 23? Is it just the uh, uh, sponsored continuing ed? Yes. Okay, so that's a yes. And then the second question is uh, the six hours of uh, supervision coursework that needs to be completed. Can that be done in category three under sponsored continuing ed, or does that have to be academic coursework in category two? I think it can be done in sponsored continuing ed, but we are getting some clarification on if there are other ways to get that. Okay. And but we will put that in our FAQ. Okay, but it definitely can be done under sponsored continuing ed. Yes. Okay. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. All right, moving on to Joaquin Galeano. Joaquin, I'm sending you a request to unmute. And Joaquin, if you see a pop up, there you go, you're unmuted. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much for putting this uh, webinar uh, together. Um, I do have a, a question about a conference. I work for a, a school district, and we are putting a, a conference, a two-day conference together on equity and diversity. And I'm wondering if I can use that for the cultural diversity and social justice uh, recording time. But it's not, the, the uh, conference is not AP approved. Hmm. So you're putting me something. Let, let me look at that. The district, yeah. So the district we are putting, um, we are putting this conference together for all the staff uh, within the district on social justice, equity, and diversity. Uh -huh. So I'm wondering if I can use uh, the hours for two days uh, for either the requirement. I wasn't sure if it was the subdirector of learning or if I can use it for. Uh, for the required um, yeah, section on, on, on uh, cultural and diversity. So it sounds like you could use it within self-directed learning and satisfy the requirement for cultural diversity that way. Although I, I'm just gonna say that with a caveat because I think we need a little more clarification and in the FAQ that will come out soon, um, I would advise you to just check that to make sure when we clarify that, that that still is true, that you could count it and count it in self-directed learning. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Huh? Okay, well, 
Thank you. This concludes the CPD webinar. I just want to give a huge thank you to the panelists, to Dr. Harbsheets, Ms. Hoganson, Ms. Ng, uh, and Ms. Sorek for assisting and answering, fielding these questions. And then a huge thank you to Ms. Fisher for moderating. Um, and for the attendees, this is going to be, if this was recorded. Uh, we will be posting it. Um, and I'll send out an email for more information. And again, if you weren't able to have your questions answered, please send me an email. The email is on the screen. And um, you guys have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you.